Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to Megos Testing Techniques webinar series. Today's topic is Fundamentals of Motor Protection. My name is Michael Fleischer, and I'm the Digital Marketing Specialist for Mega. I'll be acting as a moderator for today's presentation and supporting you on any technical issues or questions for our presenter. On the right side of your screen, you will see a control panel that looks similar to this one. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation by typing in the box highlighted in red, and I will read the questions out during the Q&A segment at the end of the webinar. Additionally, certificate of attendance, copy of the presentation, and link to the recording of this webinar will be sent to all attendees in two business days. Our presenter today is David Beard, Relay Applications Engineer. Also to assist with the question and answer session, we will have joining us Abel Gonzalez, Applications Engineer, and Sugosh Cooper, Relay Applications Engineer. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today, David. All right, thanks, Mike. Hey, uh, I would like to thank everybody uh, for joining us today. Uh, I know it's getting close to the holidays here, but uh, I really appreciate you guys' time and uh, everybody joining us today for these webinar series that we uh, put together for you guys. Um, let's get started here. Let's. Um, so what we're going to kind of go over is a little bit of the basic overview of of how the motor works. Uh, we're kind of we're going to view over. Uh, a standards glance. So basically a couple of the standards that we're going to uh, kind of talk a little bit about uh, some of the information in there uh, that relates to our, our protection topics. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the motor uh, failures, failures that can happen in motors, uh, things that we need to know uh, as far as nameplate information and uh, certain, certain types of uh, uh, manufacturer information that we need to for settings and uh, to allow us to put together the protection uh, principles and make sure that we're making uh, our protection schemes very sensitive. Uh, we want to do types of protection used. It's going to be, uh, we'll kind of go over a few of those. There's so many uh, for motor protection, um, but we weren't, we, you know, with the limited amount of time we have today, we can only cover uh, a short duration of them. And then we'll go through a summary and a Q&A uh, like we always do at the end of our webinars. So the the motor, basic motor overview, we're just going to kind of, you know, give you an overall of how the internal workings of the motor work, but, or, or not, I'm sorry, the, the internal parts of the motor we're not going to really discuss, but what we will uh, talk about is the overall concept in which the motors are used. Uh, here in the industries. So motors are used in many industries and they serve a purpose for many applications, as you can see here. Uh, what's, what was really uh, interesting to see is uh, a lot of these manufacturing plants and just, uh, you know, as I was viewing uh, and researching to what, what all uses motors and it's almost just anything uh, that can have any type of rotating machinery or any type of uh, assembly line or system uh, uses motors. And uh, what was really interesting was, you know, uh, we know the chemical plants and the recycling, we have food manufacturing, uh, metallurgy was something uh, I, I thought was really interesting. Um, the pulp and paper is a very heavy industry. Uh, up in the north uh, part of the U.S. and then also uh, manufacturing plants that manufacture uh, induction motors uh, was, was pretty neat to kind of see that. Uh, I've always wondered if they use their own motors that they create on their own on their own assembly lines, but who knows. Um, but you can also see, you know, looking at this whole whole range of, of different ways that motors are used, you can see why that 80 percent of the electrical energy produced in the world is used by is used to power these motors. Uh, since induction motors are the majority of this percentage, uh, we will be discussing this type uh, for the most part of this webinar. So we won't really get into the synchronous type motors. So we do have a couple types, and in, 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 uh, I, I know I said we're not getting into the synchronous type motor, but we are going to have to. You know, differentiate differentiate the two. Um, so, in the induction uh, motor, once it's energized, it'll create a magnetic field in the stator winding at this system speed, and that speed we're talking about is the 50 or 60 hertz, and that depends on the location uh, where you are located in the world. 
Um, so the stator winding magnetic field will induce this voltage into the rotor winding, thus drawing a current from the system. So once the rotor is up to an asynchronous speed of the 50 to 60 hertz, plus or minus the slip frequency, it will remain there until either it is shut down by system personnel or we will or if a fault occurs. Um, oh, 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 I'm taking off, I'm taking off. Apologize for that. Um, so the synchronous motor um, kind of went ahead a little bit there. So the synchronous motor piece um, is the same rules apply in the synchronous motor and, and what you'll see is that it's it gets magnetically locked uh, to the rated frequency and the reason uh, the way it does this is on the rotor it actually has a winding that's attached to the rotor that gives uh, DC excitation so it, it basically turns that rotor into an electromagnet and it locks it'll magnetically lock to the rated system frequency so there's no there's no slip uh in between there it, just like the induction motor has so in this diagram we're kind of providing just an overall simple look of what the construction of electromechanical system would look like um so we have the power supply piece uh of course it's power in the motor and then the motor is attached to the load and the power supply is designed to deliver uh, power at a specific frequency. So this is defined by the generator or the drive supplying the power to the motor. Uh, most often with the direct bus feed motors, this frequency is either 50 or 60 Hertz again, and depending on your power, which is dependent upon the, the power convention in your system uh, or in your region, I mean. So the supplied voltage uh, it's going to be fed through the three phase leads on the motor stator winding, as you see here. So based on the stator winding design, the rotating magnetic field is created. The speed of this rotating magnetic field is directly proportional to the number of poles created by the winding. So we have frequency. It's uh, actually it's the rated frequency. It's coming into the motor and then the motor is starting to uh, build up the asynchronous speed internal and then now we're trying to overcome the motor torque and the load torque to allow us to start spinning the load right or spin or what you know pumps or whatever that load could be and so this this uh synchronous field um i'm sorry i got off there a little bit so since the rotor circuit is effectively shorted with the conductive bars internal we're actually drawing a current um, since we're, yeah current begins to draw and and flow into the motor so we have the torque from the load coming in and then we're also uh, consuming power from the system and then uh, regulating the the motor uh, with using the voltage is also you know resulting we're drawing current from the system as well Now, if the rotation, um, as long as the torque that's produced by this interaction is greater than the torque required to turn the connected load, then the shaft will begin to rotate, right? So sometimes if we're not uh, overcoming this torque piece in the motor or the torque of the actual load, then we're, gonna, we're going to uh, not be able to turn this load and it'll be too much for this motor. Uh, if the load is changed in such that it is greater than the torque, then this guy could slow down or stop. So we have to, we're trying to regulate and we're trying to make sure our load uh, doesn't exceed the limitations of the motor itself. So we do have a few things that can go wrong with the motor. Uh, bad lead terminations. Um, this is mostly a human error and uh, is very important to double check or verify the motor terminations are torqued and correctly installed per manufacturer specs. Um, we also have um, electrical unbalance, which is which could be the supply voltage is unbalanced coming from the utility or generating source, which feeds the motor. 
We could also have bent shaft, uh, bent rotor shaft, and this can be caused. Excuse me, this can be caused by extremely high loading or extremely high heat. We also have rotor damage. Uh, rotor damage is the unbalanced conditions or results from bearing damage or poor workmanship. Uh, a lot of times you don't ever, uh, you know, you come through and think that uh, a lot of the things that could go wrong with the motor is, is electrically wrong, but sometimes uh, workmanship uh, plays a big, big part in that as well as, you know, making sure that the manufacturing, uh, uh, the way it's manufactured is, is done proper and uh it just manufacture defects can actually uh can make motors go uh, can damage motors and make motors not run efficiently uh so we have uh rotor damage uh rotor damage uh, i just went over that one sorry so uh, stator damage will be, so an example of stator damage um, will be single phase, uh, single phasing in the motor. Uh, it could be due to the loss of one of the three phase, one phase of the three phase supply. And this could burn the stator winding up if not taken, uh, taken care of with the proper protection. And now we have uh, lamination shorts. Uh, this can also be caused by overloading, uh, over overloading, uh, brings excessive heat and excessive heat will break down the insulation uh, inside these laminations um, and then we could have open circuit uh, manufacturing errors or a fault in the winding that could burn a conductor open uh, this could cause the motor to stop and then the last one uh, will be, uh, you know, bearing damage. Uh, bearing damage is is a common failure, and uh, it has it's because it has so many moving parts, and it's encased in a lubricating medium, but it still takes a lot of abuse, and it also holds the weight of the rotor shaft as well. So, you know, you can see why that would be our uh, a very high. And then you also have uh, other conditions, you know, other causes, um, you know, for. Uh, the wrong size wiring and poor workmanship and so forth. Um, we'll talk about a little bit about the uh, standards. Remember I was saying the standards at a glance? Okay, you've seen them, that's it. We're going to the next slide. No, we're actually uh, in this. Uh, so so <laughs> I, I just kind of want to run through those a little bit. The uh, webinar is not in this webinar is not intended to list all the requirements that we're going to go through in these standards. Um, but these are a few that that uh, I did use to some of the information from, which is very important. Um, and it does apply uh, to most of the common motor installations uh, that affect the power system design. Uh, these standards are, are thorough and they give recommendations and examples of how to apply different types of protection for different applications as well. So these are good uh, resources to have and be able to, to get a hold of. Next, we'll talk a little bit about uh, motor faults. And motor faults uh, can be present when the motor is starting or whenever the motor is in full operation and the mechanical issue shows up in the motor or uh, there's a fault in the power supply. So as you'll see here, um, this is table two from the IEEE standard uh, that I previously mentioned uh, in a couple slides back. And you'll see that it shows the most common types of failures for different types of motor designs. Um, so when you come in, looking at the chart here, uh, you'll notice just as, an, uh, you know, as they have labeled out here in this IEEE standard, you have the bearings. So you have for induction motors and synchronous, uh, where the two we uh, you know are kind of more prevalent in the industry, of course, the induction motor, and then it kind of gives you the modes of failure and what the uh, as you can see the bearing failure, uh, which most of them have mo you know with all the moving parts and so forth, is is kind of at the top of the table here. Um, but it also what's really nice is it kind of allows you to see what type of protection uh, is can be used for properly detecting. Uh, these fail component issues here. So uh, as you can see the windings, um, we also, for winding issues, we have uh, multiple array of 
of different elements. And uh, as before, there's, there's so many to go over, um, so we won't be able to do that today, but we will hit um, the major ones here. So this one, I just wanna kind of show a little bit about what these faults look like. Um, <clears throat> so this image just shows a little bit about what a single phase fault would be um, with a fault. This is a, a fault in the winding of the stator. And uh, you can kind of see the discoloration of the insulation and the leads here. So it very well could have went phase uh, to ground in here in the system or it could have been uh, one of the phases had dropped loose. Um, this could be one phase. It, we just don't know from, from you know, looking at this example here. Uh, the one on the, uh, the second image here, you can kind of see where it's a uh, turn to turn. Uh, short and it's damaged the insulation that's actually around uh, these windings that are going inside uh, this this cage here. So, but this is you know to catch things like this, uh, especially if they're internal to, to the machine, the differential protection would be good to use uh, against these types of faults. Um, bearing failures, um, you know, with this being at the top of the list, you can kind of see, um, as you, you know, uh, this image here is, it just kind of, uh, you know, when you start looking at this guy, it just seems to be that there is something that has gouged uh, the, in, the external piece of this bearing. And it could have been something that's broken off internal to the motor. Um, it could have been something that uh, wasn't uh, aligned properly. Um, but something has really took a hit inside and, and really gouged the inside of this bearing. So we that would be a replacement job, of course. And then this guy for the second picture, I mean, man, this is a nasty hit right here. Uh, the case has come off. You know, the bearings are, are just totally destroyed. Um, could have been done to overheating, could have been done to vibration. Um, and, you know, this thing right here, I, all I have to say is that's not going to buff out. Um, that guy is a, is a full replacement, of course. So motor uh, rotor faults. Um, so this one was kind of interesting. So when you look at it, the uh, rotor faults, uh, uh, you can kind of see this spin is a little bit out of place here. And uh, this one was due to erosion uh, sitting outside and then uh, a little bit of vibration is starting to crack. Uh, not just this one uh, rotor fin, but multiple rotor fins here. There's a crack here and a crack here, um, as you can see. So it, it did take a pretty good toll on it. But you know, the sim, the the fins seem to have started uh, moving also because you can kind of see that this guy's bent a little bit. So it could have moved due to the centrifugal force of the rotor moving itself. So you know, there's a lot of causes, a lot of things that could go wrong. And this could also hamper the rotor from turning smoothly inside the stator one. And then this guy here um, on this is uh, pointing out brazing. So when the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, when the shorting bars are, are being braced together, they're actually looking at this uh, cold weld here. So it doesn't look like a smooth melted metal weld. And that's where they're, uh, we kind of marked it for a brazing issue and uh, you can tell from this side is this being a good weld and this being a cold or soft weld uh, and this can cause issues and you can find this out by testing and in, in, uh, with different pieces of equipment. So motor faults uh, as we all know are very costly. Um, so why are they costly? Well, it's because it's motor downtime. Um, you know, when when the motor's down, the money's not being made. And and a lot of times that also entails a lot of other things. So now we're starting to um, chain together the scenarios that come into place when the motor's down. So now we have to repair and replace this motor. We have to, and this takes a lot of time. Um, to send these big motors in for repair and have them repaired, or we can have them repaired on location. Um, you know, it's just, uh, it depends on outweighing the cost of tearing down the old motor or replacing it with a new one. 
Um, so a lot of tools uh, also need to be bring, need to be brought on location just to even do a repair or replacement and shipping costs are costly. Um, you know, so there's a lot of little additional costs that just get added into this. The process downtime, you know, what is the motor tied to? Um, <laughs> if the motor's down, the process is down. Uh, are you able to divert the process over to uh, another uh, part of the plant and still keep it running at a at a lower mm -hmm. output? Uh, you know, the, these things have to come into mind and in what, what we can do uh, when this motor goes out. Uh, personnel scheduling issue, um, you know, we, we just to get people to come on, you know, during, uh, depends on what time of season it is, you know, because a lot of times uh, uh, a lot of plants are doing uh, maintenances, uh, maintenance schedules uh, during specific times of the year, uh, low load times and personnel scheduling is a little difficult uh, when everybody's busy and everybody's scheduled out. And then we have to add the additional factor that we're all very well aware of now, which is COVID. <clears throat> so when we have this uh, added added piece to the mix, it uh, makes this personnel scheduling uh, very difficult and also also raises the cost um, because we're having to do, uh, you know, sanitizing uh out in the field you're having to check personnel before they come on location so this this adds a whole new uh, uh cost to uh motor faults or or motor failures and then also uh you know in the end it it, it, it pretty much eats up bottom line on the profits you know and and everybody suffers in the end on this one so it's just it's just uh you know we we, we try to minimize this motor downtime so here are some things to know when we're actually um, going for uh, trying to set this information into these protective uh, functions and in these different relays. And one is full load amps. Um, what we need to do is uh, we need to find where it's printed or some type of manufactured documentation. And most of the time, as you can see here, uh, you can you can see that there's the full load amps is marked. I've got a couple images here, just some examples of where this information lays. And uh, it, everything is printed on the nameplate, full load amps. And then also, if you notice that there's a dividing line here that shows for the two different voltage levels. So at the 230 volts on this example, it's the 21.4 amps. So at a higher voltage, um, you get the lower amperage, right? So you get uh, uh, on this name plate is showing us dual voltage as well in here uh, and, and some are laid out very well um, and a lot of times too when you look at the amps they might not say full load amps which is <coughs> excuse me um, is what I see is what you can see here on this name plate and oh man I'm just going crazy here I apologize I don't know this. Okay, um, next one is service factor. So the service factor uh, is another uh, value that we need in, in the calculations for, for uh, motor protection as well, also with the thermal limits. So the service factor allows us to, how much over 100% can we run the motor and it still function at uh, uh, the specified power factor? So the service factors are labeled. Uh, all of them are labeled on the nameplate information as well. Each one uh, needs to be looked at. And uh, even in some, uh, I was looking through some relay manufacturer uh, information, and some will dictate that if you have a service factor of, of one, then it's uh, they automatically uh, tell you to calculate it at 1.05. Um, but you need to look at the manufacturer literature for that. So each um, there are some different cases for different scenarios, and this would be one of them. So I would definitely look at whichever relay protection you're going to apply and see what they're going to do, uh, what they recommend to do for a service factor of one. Um, the locked rotor current. So this value is also uh, on the nameplate, but it's not as easy to decipher uh, as as the other information so now we're going into codes um, so this code um, is a letter that's for the locked rotor it should be a kva code in the nema 
specification defines the locked rotor KDA in per horsepower. And this is an excerpt here from uh, the NEMA guide MG-1. And you'll see that where I've no located the code here, G, which is actually on this nameplate, I'll come down and cross-reference this to G in the NEMA guide, and it will tell me what the KVA per horsepower will be. And this is how I'm going to get my lock rotor current. So uh, you can find this guide online. Um, you can find this uh, uh, through the Standards Commission, um, but all these are in codes. And what I will say, uh, one thing to this too, is there's a lot of information going on in this nameplate and it's very busy and just make sure that you're reading correctly the correct code um, if you're not reading the correct one and let's say you come over here and get off and you're on b then you think this is it and you end up cross-reference b and you end up uh, with with under protecting you know the motor itself and or you could cause false tripping or you could cause you know all ty types of different events so you want to make sure that you are reading this nameplate information correctly and you are cross-referencing these numbers because there's a there's a lot going on in these nameplates uh, other information that we that we can get to and it's in most of the times so obtained by the motor manufacturers is the permissible continuous allowable temperature rise so what is it allowed to to rise in temperature uh, so sometimes it's a 10 degree rise um, for it to be able to keep your insulation levels uh, still in operating conditions and not damage the motor. Uh, we also need the acceleration time uh, if you can get that information. Uh, if you have uh, old motors that um, you know don't have any nameplates or all the drawings are gone or you know all the information's out then some of this information you're not able to get. So. Uh, the rated voltage, the rated voltage, of course, is, you know, uh, is on the uh, nameplate as well. If not, uh, you know, you should have some drawings and schematics for that information. And then, two, the uh, uh, other important item is the motor thermal uh, compatibility curve. And what this guy is, is he allows us to see where the motor, the thermal cap capability curve lies within the starting uh currents of the motor itself and this is very useful because i will show you here in a moment where we really need to utilize this information um, types of protection we're going to go into our protection types now um, so the phase uh overcurrent protection this will be the first one that we start with um, it, it, most of the time the motor is at the end of the line Right, so we, after all the feeders, the motor is the guy on the end of the line. So um, we need to make sure that um, that we set the uh, it must be set above the starting the the instantaneous overcurrent needs to be set above the starting current, um, and also if it needs to have some inherent small time delay in there. But most of the time it just sets, uh, you know, we can just set this value above the starting current because if the motor doesn't start properly, then what happens is either it doesn't start and we have no current and no trip, or we also have the motor starts and something's wrong and our current just skyrockets. So we need the instantaneous level there for app protection. Um, and also for short circuit protection um, in, in uh, where the fault current can be uh, the highest at the terminals uh, of the motor. Uh, we also have, uh, so so the next one will be time over current. And uh, this just means that the trip, uh, the trip is inversely proportional to the fault current. So what allows us to do is this allows us to coordinate uh, the time over current elements with the thermal model. Um, and it also helps, this helps with protecting the locked rotor and also with um, the starting uh, component decay. So when I told you uh, about three or four slides ago that there was a motor compatibility curve, um, that's was, this is what I was talking about, is we can take this curve uh, that you can get from the motor manufacturer and then you will take what uh, relay manufacturer uh, time curve that you have that you wanted to use or compare against and overlay these guys. So this will allow you to actually see 
the coordination between the thermal curve and your actual um, uh, time over current curve for the relay itself. And this helps a lot with, uh, they, they used to call these uh, volt skins um, in, in the uh, time over currents uh, relays and you could take them and they were so thin you could just overlay them on top of, of the machine or device. Uh, you know, these motor thermal curves, you could just lay them on top of it and see through them. So that was also really nice. Uh, you know, it, it just, those are the days of paper. Oh man. Okay. Um, so the 50 G, so we have ground protection and, um, there's, there's a couple different ways to do this. Um, so you, this is the preferred method, uh, to do and the CT provides a magnetic summation of the three currents here. So the secondary output of the reload will be zero if everything is balanced. Um, this also provides a better reliability during across the line starting by eliminating the false startup currents resulting from the unequal saturation of the CTs during startup. So the, the, only, the limitation to this is that all three of these conductors may not physically pass through the CT window. So when you have that scenario, then you need to come, here's application number two. So how can we, how can we get out of that one? So what we do is we have multiple different ways to do things. So now um, we can take the CT or not the CT, we can take the relay and mount it. Um, the, uh, we can set, um, I'm sorry, we can connect the CT in the residual circuit of the phase CTs. This just like we have here. Uh, the physical size won't be an issue um, because we're connecting in the circuit um, and we don't actually have a CT that we're going to be running through uh, with each individual motor or the return. And then also we need to make sure that we set this thing above any false residual currents that can result from unequal performance or high unequal offset starting currents. Uh, prevent the probability of false relay operation. Uh, as well, as long as the CT burdens are limited to the voltage developed by uh, the saturation of the CT. So uh, that gives you that second option. Uh, the next option we have is we, uh, our next element is uh, differential protection. And the differential protection is very similar to that of generator protection. Uh, both ends of the motor serves as the primary winding of the CT, as you can see here because we're going to, uh, the way the CTs are tied are on the primary side of the motor and on the neutral side of the motor as well. But the neutral, uh, the CTs on the neutral side will be the same ratio as the CTs on the phase side. And the connections will be made inside the neutral connection uh, as it's shown. So you can see here where, where, uh, uh, the CTs are lying inside this connection. So on a drawing, this looks a little, di you know, it looks very easy. Um, but what I want to show you is the actual, what it looks like. Um, so <clears throat> this one is going to, um, you'll notice this is the neutral bar. I was explaining here, a little bit different diagram, um, but the neutral bar is still tied together. And you can see this neutral bar here where all these returns are being tied in. And, uh, this is the same uh, return cable that's coming back from the motor. And this is just showing the, the actual cable coming back through the same CT. And this, <coughs> and of course the summing CT itself, and these CTs are gonna sum the current flows of the motor winding from the motor going into the CT, tied to the neutral and coming back. And you can see that, that connection here at the bottom. So it's, you can see that the motor leads are going into the motor, back into the motor winding, and then coming back out to return and being tied to the bus bar, which you can see here. <coughs> Excuse me. So how does the differential current work? Um, so the, diff the, the basic principle of how differential protection works is if we have uh, within our protected zone of our CTs, 
we have our motor and then we have neutral on line side and this is just a you know an example just kind of showing you how how the protection uh, goes so as currents are flowing uh, from the motor <coughs> currents are being pulled I'm sorry <coughs> excuse me um, so the line the motor's drawing the line uh, supply from the line we get an external fault outside of our protected zone then our CTs are still drawing current and everything is looking good right so everything is is moving we don't have any type of differential current because our fault is actually uh, outside of our protected zone inside of the the uh, motor relay so we will not see any currents that are going to add up across the relay therefore we get no trip so what if that um, fault was inside the protected zone well you know the same scenario is going to apply but it's it's going to be a little bit different because now we have that the line is actually feeding this fault that's inside of our protected zone and now our currents are showing differential current around the the relay itself because now we have uh, our currents are adding up uh, since they're coming in and feeding this external or this internal fault oh man i'm telling you <laughs> yeah so not getting the trip So now we're now we move on to uh, phase reversal. So when starting a motor, it is good practice to make sure that you're connected correctly so that the phases are not reversed. Um, you know, because this can cause catastrophic damage if the motor's rotated in the wrong direction. Uh, as you can see, it's just a <coughs> this this is some heavy heavy duty stuff. But the uh, relay can detect for. Uh, for this simple application and this will help verify the phase rotation measured uh, compares to the phase rotation setting in the relay so right now we're looking at phase rotation with abc going counterclockwise rotation and it's going to give us all positive sequence so if i reverse two phases electrically then our positive sequence goes down to nothing or very low value, not to nothing, very low value. And then now we're going to get a one per unit value for what we had in positive sequence is now going to equal that of negative sequence. And now we're we are electrically rotating clockwise rotation instead of and we're still wired physically for a counterclockwise position. So this thing can get a yeah, it's a, it's a phase reversal protection is is very easy to set. Uh, it's just an ABC or a uh, uh, phase rotation setting, and, and the relay usually takes it from there. Uh, relay locked rotor uh, protection can be a loss of supply uh, in one of the phases. Um, we can have mechanical problems. Uh, we can have a low voltage supply, um, which doesn't allow the motor to overcome the load torque, or we can have excessive torque. Uh, which can be kind of almost a mixture of the two. If we have low voltage supply, we could uh, in turn create excessive torque, right? Uh, or we can have something that the motor's tied to and it's not able to overcome, uh, you know, actually able to drive that load and uh, get it moving. <clears throat> so during startup, as expected though, there will be large current draw from the supply and this will cause extremely high temps inside the motor. But until the motor gets up to speed and has and has began to move, that's when it'll improve its cooling because that the fan that's internal of the motor needs to be moving. Um, the locked rotor protection is uh, is basically protected with an overcurrent relay with an adjustable time delay, and this relay will trip the motor when it exceeds its permissible starting time. But it needs to be, but it doesn't need to do it before this. I'm sorry. <coughs> exceeds a permissible starting time but before the safe stall with stand time so also this element also needs to be tied uh, to a restart inhibit which needs to be set um, because you don't want to constantly keep pounding this guy um, especially if you got a lock rotor condition you just you know if you have an issue you, do, you don't want it to keep doing it um, so if you look at the graph here 
uh, it kind of gives you a, an idea of how to set this guy. So, right, so the current, the starting current of the motor is going to be, uh, uh, what do we say, six times, uh, and it's going to be six times full load amps. It comes in here, and then it's actually going to be uh, set for a duration of time before it starts leveling off. So you want to make sure that you set your relay current setting high enough that we uh, cover for this current, but also we need to add a time delay to allow the motor to level off. If this motor doesn't level off, then this current's going to keep going and it's going to start getting into the relay time delay and then the relay is going to trip. So it'd be taking this scenario and moving it up. Uh, mechanical jam protection. Uh, serves to protect the motor during sudden rotor blocking and allows for a quick motor shutdown. Now the motor can stall when the motor load torque exceeds the breakdown torque and the speed of the motor goes to zero or to a point below rated speed. But, you know, chaos can rear its ugly head, of course, and sometimes there's a lot of conditions that can take place during the time the motor seems to be doing fine. But when the issues arise, you'll know that it's like in the image, the shaft can break off and twist, um, or we can have uh, we can lose the prime on a pump or shear the drive pin. Um, I, I want to put this piece in here to just kind of show there's a lot of little mechanical parts, and even with this being on a, a generator, is a good example to kind of see what else can happen. Uh, you know, not only will the drive of the shaft, uh, you know, spin as well, but also this has got a huge knuckle, so there can be a lot of mechanical jam within here. Uh, so that's, it's, you know, making sure all the movable parts work. So here's an example of the uh, locked rotor protection. So it is, like I said earlier, it's basically just an overcurrent relay with an adjustable time delay as we saw. So the relay will trip the motor and then when it exceeds its permissible starting time, but before the safe stall with stand time. So let's see what happens. So now in this example, we're actually going to bring uh, power in. So we're bringing the power into the motor. And once it, it's uh, supplying the power supply, we're getting current. We're actually supplying power to the motor now. And then the motor deter tries to turn. And, you know, apparently we have an issue with this guy. Um, so the rotor's not going to move because the contact's closed and uh, it's calling for the motor to turn on, but the motor's just, just stuck. So guess what? Uh, there's that cost savings again, right? It's all that money's just going all over the place because you're going to have to pay for a new motor or you're going to have to spend time to troubleshoot. Um, load loss protection. So we can set this, um, uh, the low set, uh, forward power relay or the element um, is technically what is monitoring the load and this will be possible to use. Um, this will help protect, protect against the pump from becoming unprimed or stop a motor on an assembly line because the conveyor belt broke. Um, this type of protection will also uh, need to be interlocked with the motor starting device to prevent operation when the motor is tripped because this can prevent a motor start as well. Uh, when starting a motor against a very low load, then this function will need to be inhibited long enough to allow the motor to get to 100%. And then the power is uh, is more accurate representation. So when you use in the power uh, uh, load loss for the power, it's actually giving you a better uh, representation of what that loading was before and after an event should an event occur. And then the, uh, you can also use uh, undercurrent elements um, for this type of protection as well. And what the element will do is trip or alarm, depending on how it's set, and the current levels, uh, once these current levels have dropped below the set points. Now, this element will need to be set above the expected no low current, but less than the minimum expected current when the motor is operating normally. So most relays will have this element um, in their in per unit of FLA, which will be full load amps. So load loss, um, load loss protection. Uh, 
what we were explaining earlier. Uh, this is a good little example here. And uh, what we're doing is, again, using the same model as we did before for supplying power to the motor. We have, a, you know, we're supplying the, the, the proper frequency and supply to the motor. The motor is building up speed. The motor is actually taking on the load. So now the load is spinning and we got our torque and everything's looking good. We're drawing power from the system. We're regulating the motor itself. And all of a sudden the shaft breaks off and we don't have load anymore. So we have completely lost this guy. Um, the motor was needs to be shut down. And, uh, you know, with the load loss protection element, we're not seeing that load. It's, it has went to zero pretty much on this scenario. And uh, uh, we should receive a trip to uh, trip this motor. So under voltage protection. Um, uh, you know, this is this is a pretty pretty um, common sense kind of go around. Uh, you know, under voltage. Uh, if we don't have the proper voltage, we're not able to start what we need to start. Um, but the low supply voltage to a motor uh, can result in a loss of speed, uh, and it could draw heavy load currents. So preventing from reaching these rated speeds as well. So if the motor, let's say if uh, the motor was already running. And runs into an issue, then it can lose speed, lose speed, and fall out of sync. So you can see here that we have a low voltage scenario now happening. So we're delivering power to the motor, and you know, of course, the motor can't start because the power is not as as uh, it's not up to where it needs to be. And I uh, most most um, uh, relays kind of look at an eighty percent to a hundred percent. I think eighty being the low end. Uh, so from what I've been uh, working through. So it does take a minute to kind of get um, uh, this troubleshooted a little bit, but in turn, again, it still kind of costs you money because this thing's down and you're having to troubleshoot your cabinet now or your your uh, power, power supply. Uh, also, uh, if your motor runs into a, uh, loses power, the high inertia of the load can also drive um the high inertia low can also drive this as well so it can start spinning that motor even without um, the torque of the motor being there. so thermal protection uh there's a lot of ways in which a motor can produce excessive heat like overloading the motor periodically or for just a prolonged duration of time um so you can have single phasing uh, unbalance of the supply voltage. Uh, generally, the insulation's life is halved for every 10 degrees C rise in the temperature above the rated thermal limits. So we need to protect the asset with thermal protection. And you can see here, uh, this is an example and it's out of the uh, standards as well, uh, the IEEE standard um, that I mentioned before. And this is just kind of gives you an overall look of the motor starting currents and our starting voltages. I apologize. Uh, well, this is actually current here. Yeah, starting currents. And you have 80% and 100%. Um, and then also here's your thermal loading curve. And as we saw before, we're trying to take this curve and match it against the overload. Um, and, and you also have the motor thermal damage curve as well. So we want to make sure that we coordinate. It's a, it's a tight space in there. Uh, but we would just want to make sure that we can also get everything coordinated properly and uh, protect it as well. So with the motor, um, it kind of gives you this. So this is an example here of a thermal element. And then we're using the motor characteristics to actually draw uh, or draw, but we're overlapping motor characteristic inside of the uh, thermal overload. So we want to make sure that we're not operating for uh, normal operating temperatures, but also too, we want to make sure that we're running that tight line where we can actually run this motor to full capacity and uh, use the most that we can out of it. We definitely don't want to false trip it either. Uh, also in the motors, um, you can use RTD biasing. And what that does is that allows for the measured values to be used uh, in the thermal calculations rather than using a thermal model which uses the nameplate settings. 
um, RTD biasing is actually a more accurate way to determine the motor uh, characteristics because it, it's an actual sensor that sits inside, uh, uh, is placed inside the motor itself and it can measure that information rather than calculating it um, from just the, the uh, nameplate issues that could be put on the motor uh, nameplate. Uh, thermal protection. So this is kind of a little example how thermal protection works. Um, get your power, right? We gotta get power from the power supply. And once we get the power in from the power supply, um, we're getting good voltage here. Yeah, looks good. And then we're going to start uh, putting a little bit of power. Current's starting to go. All right, our motor's getting it. Now our motor starts going and it's operating and uh, it's starting to overheat. And, you know, we, we for protection, we need to make sure that we have um, uh, protection to, to prevent our motor from from overheating as well and uh, you know definitely this is a uh, you know cost of money again here it is um, but if you you know with the right protection or you know not overloading your motor and making sure that uh, you know good maintenance is done this can this can uh, definitely save uh, you a ton of money in, in the long run. The uh, current and under voltage protection I think this is our last one and we'll go over um, usually is a typical starting current is about six times FLA. Uh, I think I said that earlier as well. Um, so you also have uh, this this starting uh, this startup current can be used as a baseline if no other documentation is available as well. Um, and like we were saying earlier, that there's a lot of documentation that you don't necessarily get, um, or if you're coming into a new facility and all that information is gone, um, or you can't find it, or you know. Uh, that's always a, a big headache as well. Um, the typical of the 1% voltage unbalance will equate uh, to the 6% uh, percent current unbalance as well. So when you're setting this, um, uh, this is pretty common. Um, in, in what I put on here as typicals because I've read through multiple uh, relay manufacturer manuals and uh, most of them are pretty, uh, or almost the uh, state very similar. Uh, to the one one percent to the six, so this seems to be the typical round for this. And then the uh, unbalanced equation here is something I pulled from uh, one of the relay manufacturer's manuals, and uh, just kind of gives you an overall how you know how simple this can be. Uh, the A factor here that it's uh, talking about here's a simplified version of what the A factor entails would be pretty much the uh, in impedance of this motor itself. Um, a lot of times in the, uh, if you don't have this information, then you can actually get, uh, just use it uh, set to one. Uh, so this just be a value is just set to one most of the time. And again, this looks at the different relay manufacturers manuals because each relay manufacturer is different and each one state a different uh, default value to use for their particular uh, setup. And then also uh, the um, we also want to make sure that the relay settings account for the negative sequence currents that could be present but not coming from the motor protective circuit. Um, this could be an external component that could be also seen by the relay. Therefore, the time should be allowed for the appropriate protection to clear. Uh, this will also help prevent unnecessary negative sequence currents from being introduced into the motor circuit and overheating the motor. Uh, that's unnecessary uh, because we don't want anything to affect uh, our motor that we're trying to use. Uh, also, a good thing to point out too is that uh, you can have unusually high unbalanced values, um, and this can be caused by incorrect phase CT wiring as well. Um, so that that can be due to uneven uh, heating uh, into you know as we saw before in the negative sequence or phase reversal, we saw a bunch of, uh, we almost went one per unit in negative sequence currents, and yet that creates a lot of unnecessary heating that we don't need. Oh, wow. Okay, summary. All right, all right, all right, there we go. So uh, this is our product line uh, at the end of our uh, of our webinars. We'd like to kind of show you guys what we have. You know, we, we, we do uh, have lots of relay test equipment. 
Um, we have different varieties and different sizes for all different applications. Um, all these relay uh, test sets uh, have the same software, um, and we have a lot of these software uh, uh, in these units and test plans that we can use um, to test uh, motor protective relays. So if you guys are interested, definitely reach out to us. So I have some information at the end of this uh, webinar. And then the uh, here's something I always like to show is the uh, in our software as well as you can provide connection notes. Um, as you can see, I have uh, uh, just an old manual I just pulled out of a relay and you can add connection notes and you can actually take this screenshot out and you can actually put it into the uh, relay test plan, you know, and that's a uh, very helpful. Uh, I, I think sometimes, uh, like it said, you know, pictures give a thousand words, right? So it's nice to be able to have a note area where you can take a picture of, of your diagram or how you connect it and input it into your test plan. So a little bit of the summary, uh, motor types and the protection required. Um, so as discussed, there are different types of motors. Um, in the NEMA guide, uh, the MG-1 and the IEEE uh, 37, uh, C3796, uh, the guide for AC motor protection, uh, they have a lot of guidelines in here and they will assist you with the most common failures also that happen to motors, but also what protection elements can help minimize those damages against these faults. Um, the phase and ground overloads and, and short circuits uh, can produce high daily currents, and it is very important to protect personnel first and second the equipment against these types of faults. These schemes have been working for over 75 years, 75 plus years, and, and this allows the motor not to get into an overload situation uh, when, when loads change or internal or external faults happen. Differential protection can be configured in different ways um, and make sure that it is wired in the field. What the wiring in the field is the same as what's on the as-built drawing, as drawings. And what I mean are those are the completed drawings from, from uh, any substation uh, that should be on record on file and make sure that the currents uh, are canceling out in under normal operating conditions and only operate during abnormal conditions. So is a good time to kind of test your, your relay settings as well as you make these. Um, the uh, fourth point here for the phase reversal. Uh, so the phase reversal, the motors can create the damage, can create, da uh, can create damage to the attached load and to itself if not properly connected. And connected for the correct phase rotation, uh, relays will have elements that will help protect against this uh, uh this this issue like i was saying earlier you can just set a phase rotation element and as soon as it uh, senses the reversal then it can issue a trip or an alarm however you want you wish to uh, configure that uh, load loss and mechanical jam uh, you've seen what that thing can do that's a, that's a nasty guy um, but you know it's just it's just one of the many scenarios that could take place and most microprocessor relays have an element that's late that's specifically just for load jam, uh, jam trip, load trip. So you can kind of get, uh, they kind of isolated a couple of those elements out for you. Uh, in the electromechanical world, um, you know, you're probably going to have individual uh, uh, individual relays on a panel. So you're probably going to have a lot of relays uh, in there, but there will be uh, something very similar to just an overcurrent relay that can help protect that. Um, the undervoltage, uh, issues that can help prevent a motor from starting, or if the motor's already running and under voltage issue occurs, uh, then the proper 27 element will need to be set. And the machines, and this, it needs to be set, uh, so that way, if you do have an under voltage condition while the, while the motor's running, that the motor doesn't continually start spinning because of the high inertia of the load itself. So we want to make sure we, uh, uh protect that. The, uh, Second last one, the thermal elements um, are basis for motor protection. So they it, thermal is is pretty much uh, what is what, what is the basis of the motor, uh, of course. But you know that thing runs in temperatures, extreme temperatures inside, extreme temperatures outside. 
Um, it also runs uh, hot with loads. It gets overloaded occasionally. Um, you know, thermal elements are very important and it's really nice to have the RTD biasing because it gives you a little bit of the of, of better accuracy in what that motor is doing out there. Uh, you don't physically have to go out there and take measurements all the time or you're relying on nameplate information uh, that's used in the thermal model. Um, so we want to make sure that, you know, if you have the opportunity to use the RTDs, um, you know, uh, I would suggest to do so. Um, and then the last one, but not least, is the unbalancing. Uh, like we said, is uh, everything I've read through uh, is typically about a 1% uh, voltage unbalance, which is, you know, can equate about six to five percent um, uh, current unbalance. So uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, listening to my webinar today. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I think Mr. Mike is going to kind of take this away. Yep. Thanks a lot, David. Right. So at this time, the presentation portion of our webinar is officially concluded. We'll now take some time to answer as many of your questions as possible. If you have any questions, please submit them now into the Q&A box on the GoToWebinar control panel. For those of you that are leaving, when you close the webinar window, a survey should pop up on your screen. We would greatly appreciate it if you could take a couple of minutes to provide your feedback so we can continue to improve upon our future webinars. On the survey, there's a field where you can also request a quote or a demo on any Mega product. A copy of this presentation, certificate of attendance, and a link to the video recording of this webinar will be emailed to everyone in about two business days. You can also view video recordings of previous webinars, as well as register for upcoming webinars on our website at us.megger.com slash webinars, and register for our next webinar this upcoming or this uh, next month, December 18th, titled Low Voltage Circuit Breaker Ground Fault Protection Utilizing Primary Injection Test Method. All right, let's jump into your questions. The first one I have, I'm going to be directing towards Abel Gonzalez. Abel, do paper machines use induction motors or DC motors? Um, hi, Mike, can you hear me? Uh, yep. We're uh, okay, glad. thanks. Uh, thank Mike. Thanks for the question. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, I've been thinking about it since I saw it. The, I, I want to remind those out there who may be of, uh, you know, a little bit older. Do you guys remember what a Ward Leonard uh, system is? That used to be that. That's a an induction machine powering up a DC generator controlling a, a DC motor. Uh, the idea to you of using three machines to control one was because the DC machine, you know, you can control the um, the speed and the torque of the DC machine very well if you're able to control the voltage uh, fed to the to the machine and to control the voltage fed to the machine you use the DC generator uh, and uh, to move that DC generator you use the AC machine and then to control the voltage output of that DC generator you were you, you used to control the the voltage of the field of the DC generator that's a complicated setup right uh, well it was used a lot um, because when you needed accurate control of speed and uh, torque of a machine, you went to the DC machines because AC machines are uh, a lot harder, uh, tougher, stronger, easier, but they were very hard to control when it came to proper control of the, the speed and the torque of the machine. But that all changed in the 80s with the uh, introduction of uh, uh, vector control, and then in the 90s when that uh, you know went um, uh, mainstream, and 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 I guess I'm doing this uh, historical perspective because in uh, in the 90s there was a huge change where AC machines that 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 we knew what needed to be done to control from you know the 1920s, but it was not easy to to do it because we didn't have the the, the tools and then with the introduction of proper uh, silicon uh, that, that we can control and use in inverters and then uh, the, the introduction of variable frequency drives, that all changed. What I'm trying to say is that paper machines, uh, you can use them with both DC and AC motors. Uh, DC motors are still used because of the, uh, the fact that uh, a lot of those installations are very old. Uh, but uh, if you were to use it in a, 
an environment today where you could choose, I guess the, the choice would be to use a variable frequency drive with an AC or induction induction motor. Uh, it would be, I guess, uh, perhaps a little bit uh, more expensive than using a DC machine, uh, but it's going to be way better when it comes to the possibilities of control, maintenance, and uh, and and whatnot. So uh, I guess that's that 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 would be the the answer to that question. Isabel? Yeah. Okay. Uh, next, I'm going to send our questions over to Sugosh Kuber. Sugosh, which motor type is most common, induction or synchro? Uh, Thanks, Michael. So uh, what we've seen is, you know, usually induction motors are most commonly used uh, when we compare it to synchronous motors. Uh, I would say as close as, you know, close to 80 or 90 percent of the motors that are used in the industry today, they account for induction type. Uh, you know, there can be many reasons why, you know, one would be chosen over the other. You know, the, the way they work is, of course, different from each other, you know, the induction and synchronous machines. Um, the usage also uh, varies depending on what applications you need them for, right? So, you know, for example, like synchronous motor is, it's a doubly excited machine, whereas induction motor is a single excited machine. So like for as comparison, if you compare both type of motors on the same voltage level, and of course the same output, uh, synchronous motors are considered to be more expensive as compared to induction. So Again, there are various reasons why you would find one more than the other. It just depends on you know all these five different factors. All right, thanks, Gosh. Next is over to Abel. Uh, Abel, is rotor damage common, e.g., open shorting bars? Sorry, guys, I was muted. Um, yes, actually, um, depending on where you get your numbers, and there are being many. Um, statistical, I would say, studies over the years, and the numbers are published by different uh, manufacturers, etc. Um, between six and thirteen percent of faults found in uh, in motors are related to um, to the rotor itself. Um, of those, uh, a, a significant number uh, has to do with uh, broken bars in induction motors, which is, I guess, where the question um comes to now a broken bar in the in the induction motor um is uh, something that can could and could not be catastrophic to the to the motor it depends on how much load you are trying to get to to, to you know to how much load is connected to to the motor, what are the specific conditions under which the motor is uh, is operating? Um, uh, an induction motor could be operating uh, with a broken bar, and uh, you not know it until perhaps you do some maintenance, or you realize that there is a lot of vibration, or perhaps the motor cannot give you enough torque for the uh, load that you are um, um, trying to to supply with it. Uh, so yes, the 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 broken or um, or open bars um, in the in the rotor of the of the induction motor is a uh, pretty common uh, occurrence. I'm not going to say that it's something that happens uh, every day, but when it comes to failure modes, it's one that can be perhaps between five and and and, and ten percent of the uh, uh, failures out there. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Next is over to Sugosh. Uh, Sugosh, what are the advantages or disadvantages of each of the presented scheme of motor protection by neutral or uh, for which you are uh, should be installed? Okay, uh, that's a good question. So, uh, you know, uh, like David explained, uh, there, are, there are multiple ways of uh, detecting ground faults, you know, in the motor protection. So, uh, the first method would be, the, the you know, the zero sequence CT approach. Uh, it's uh, highly sensitive. The way this uh, works is, you know, all the phase conductors are, are passed through a single CT, which is, you know, referred to as a zero sequence CT. Ideally, the sum of these currents would uh, would result in a zero uh, output, which means, you know, there is all it's all balanced. But let's say if one of those uh, phases are is shorted to ground, so now the sum of these currents would not be zero anymore. Uh, which will which will you know create zero sequence currents in the C, uh, through that CT for the relay to see and trip. 
right? So this is uh, one of the methods. And so I, I would say this is the recommended, ideally recommended method. But now again, it depends on, on the, uh, you know, all the statistics as to how large your cables are that you're, that you're trying to fit them through the zero sequence CTs. Now let's say those cables are so large that you that you cannot fit them through zero sequence CT window, then uh, you would have to go uh, use the residual ground fault configuration, right? Uh, so so the residual ground fault configuration is of course it's less sensitive than the zero sequence uh, CT approach. Um, again, it just depends on what you what you could use the best. So. For for instance, if you're using a residual uh, ground fault configuration, and let's say that there's motor starting, you know, when there's a motor starting, the currents currents uh, increase as up to you know to six times of the FLA. Now let's say if, even if there's a slight mismatch of these CTs combined, you know, with this high current magnitudes that the relay is trying to see, there might be uh, sometimes a false residual current that the relay sees. So the relay may misinterpret this as a ground fault. Uh, so, so you have to be a little careful when you are using these methods uh, in trying to set up the protection. So, so it depends on on the situation you're in, the type of cables you're using in, in the installation, um, and the protection you're using. I hope I answered that question. Thanks, Gosh. Next is back over to David. David, at your discretion, when should we use the differential protection on the motor? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, so, I, yeah, I didn't state that in there. Um, so, a good rule of thumb is uh, voltage levels of motors that are 2400 uh, up to 13.8 kV uh, will be good for the motor protection or good for differential protection. But really, any motor or voltage size is is good for for the protection. Um, it isn't normally used uh, for lower end uh, lower voltage motors. But um, in two, the, you know, usually you got to add CTs and the cabinets are bigger and you have more room to do stuff. So it, it almost just depends on how, how far you want to go with the differential. If you want to go ahead and add it to your system, uh, if you have room to add the CTs, uh, if you have room to add all that information, uh, it wouldn't hurt. I mean, it wouldn't uh, hurt it at all. So uh, it just gives you more uh, protection and sensitivity in there. But you just just you know making sure that you can coordinate that differential protection with the other uh, uh, items that you do have uh, would be key. So, thank you. All right. Next is over to Abel. Abel, could you please briefly explain what protection is used against loss of synchronism and how does it work? Okay. Well, the the first thing to I guess uh, complete the the question is what are we talking about when we're talking about loss of synchronism this is uh something that applies to synchronous motors uh remember that in the synchronous motor the rotor of the motor is supposed to rotate at the same speed of the uh let's call it the the magnetic field of the of the stator so if we have a two-pole machine that means that the magnetic field or the maximum value of the magnetic field of the stator is rotating at uh, uh, 3,600 uh, revolutions per minute. That means that the, the rotor in a synchronous motor has to rotate at that same speed. And the way that's achieved is by injecting a field into the rotor of the synchronous motor. It's a DC field. It's not created by the external field and therefore can lock to the external field and still produce torque, right? So um, if, an in, if a synchronous motor, um, if in the synchronous motor, the rotor starts moving at a speed that's lower than that of the synchronous field, then you have what's called loss of synchronism. Now, why does loss of synchronism happen in a, a synchronous motor? Uh, the first thing is that it could be simply because you applied uh, to the uh, shaft of the of the motor, a load that's too high for the motor to handle. What happens then is that the motor is going to uh, break a little bit, so it's going to start moving a little bit slower. The rotor is going to move a little bit slower than the uh, external field. 
and there you have a loss of, of synchronism. The, the load could be so high that it could provoke a stall or it could provoke, provoke the, the rotor to uh, stop moving at all, okay? Um, the, the other reason for a uh, loss of synchronism could be a drop in the uh, voltage supplied um, to the to the rotor because then it cannot produce enough torque and then you will have the uh, uh, the same problem. Motor is going to uh, start um, losing because of you know the the the, the fact that uh, it, it 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 has to try to equal the the torque produced, the electromagnetic torque produced by the rotor with the torque demanded by the by the load. And the other uh, reason uh, or another reason could be that the excitation uh, in the in the rotor, remember that the field that uh, we inject in the rotor is an external uh, field produced by injecting DC into the field of the of the rotor is the amount of uh, energy being uh, injected into the field in the rotor of the motor is too low, then the same thing happens. You will not have enough power to drive the motor at the synchronous speed. Okay, so, um, the, how do you protect against all that? Well, you have to measure the uh, voltages and currents going into the motor, and uh, that's you know done by all the all the relays uh, protection relays uh, out there. And you have to measure all of the voltages and currents going into the relay, and then you have several options. One of them, the uh, I would say one of the more known one is a protection known as um, uh, out of step uh, protection. Uh, it basically what it does is it tries to determine the trajectory of the uh, positive sequence impedance as measured by the relay into the um, into the machine. If that trajectory brings the uh, impedance of the uh, machine as seen by the relay into the left side of the uh, um, impedance plane, then you detect a, uh, a loss of uh, synchronism um, and you can uh, either trip or alarm or depending on uh, what you uh, feel like uh, the, the, the conditions of the operation have to, have to be. Um, another thing that you can do is you can use the AA power factor relay and, I, and I'm only going to mention these two because there are probably 15 or, or more different methods of, of detecting this, but I guess these two would be the, the most uh, popular ones. And on the power factor side, it's not only the power factor, you could measure the power down. Remember that the synchronous motor um, is supposed to operate at a power factor that could be either unity, a power factor of one, or uh, a power factor between 0.8 on both sides, either leading or lagging. If the power factor of the machine, remember the power factor is what? If the power factor is the uh, cosine of the angle between the voltage and the current or the cosine of the angle of the impedance as seen at the relay or the impedance, the apparent impedance that the motor represents for the relay that's measuring the voltages injected into the motor and the currents that, being, that are being uh, um, taken by the, by the motor uh, as, a, as a load. So if if that power factor goes beyond that uh, that 0.8 uh, percent that uh, that we're talking about, then we can declare uh, a condition of loss of, of synchronism. How, however, that uh, may not be that may be like a something too too tight. So maybe the the the, the adjustment the adjustment the setting for that. Uh, number, um, you may not want to use 0.8%, maybe you want to use a, a higher a value on both, uh, on both sides. And the thing is that with power factor, you have um, active power and apparent power going uh, into, the, into, the, into the motor. When the motor uh, power factor changes, also the um, amount of reactive energy that the motor uh, takes changes. Remember, if it is a synchronous motor, it's supposed to um, take very little or no uh, reactive power from the system. When the amount of reactive power taken by that inductor, by that synchronous motor um, becomes too high, then you have what's called a, an asynchronous operation, which again is the 
consequence of the loss of synchronism in the so that's another option that you have when it comes to protecting against the loss of the loss of synchronism like i said i'm only going to discuss these uh, uh, three options there are many out there that you can uh, that you can find okay all right okay wonderful uh, and while i have you abel uh, the next question is going to be sent over to you uh does nema mg1 only apply in the usa um well actually it, it applies wherever the nema mg1 is adopted as a uh, as a standard it is a uh, standard that is originated in the in the usa by nema uh, the national electrical manufacturers association and it's adopted um all over the uh, the united states here in canada it's used it's used in in, in places like mexico for example uh but again it, it depends on the, whether the national uh, standards body of the country that uh, we are talking about uh, decides to uh, uh adopt nema or parts of uh, of nema which is something that i know uh that happens sometimes the standards are not adopted in its uh, entirety but only a, the part of the standard that uh, wants to be adopted at a particular place, and some places have their own uh, their own uh, their own standards. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Next is over to Sugosh. Sugosh, with regards to motor differential protection, do you compensate for any CT lead length differences to the protective relay, or is this compensated by a small slope value? Okay. So. Um... So you know when we talk about the CT lead length, it's uh, proportional to the the resistance of the leads, right? And so the resistance of the leads, uh, uh, it affects a burden, which uh, which can be uh, it can in turn be a reason for the saturation. So in one way, yes, it is compensated by the uh, slope value you choose. The reason I say that it's compensated by the slope value you choose is that. Um, you know the the slope characteristic it's used to prevent uh, you know improper operation or you know of the scheme uh, of the scheme any to any time uh, you know it sees the external force right it only has to trip for internal force and and these these imbalances that you see in the system you know they can be caused because of ct accuracy errors or ct saturation so the slope that you design takes care of these errors or the, you know accounts for these these errors uh the slope characteristic you know it, it allows for being very sensitive uh when the fall current is really low and if you have a relay where you can have a, like a dual slope characteristic the the now the characteristic would be less sensitive on the second slope where the fall current is so high and you know because the ct performance can produce incorrect operate operating signals in the in, for the relay All right, thank you, Sagosh. Uh, next, back over to Abel. Abel, I noticed that one of your motor nameplates was showing an altitude reading. What is the purpose of this if you have an ambient temperature reading? Uh, well, the thing is that the uh, ambient temperature reading is a number that is given at a particular atmospheric pressure of uh, you know one uh, atmosphere or the uh, uh, atmospheric pressure at sea level what happens at higher altitudes is that the air becomes thinner and uh, most of the heat leaves the motor because you know there are various ways in which the the heat is uh, you know transferred from one body to another one being conduction two bodies in uh, touching each other uh, the other one being radiation. The heat is being radiated via electromagnetic waves, you know, photons leaving the, 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 the machine. But the, the third one, which is the most important for the motor, is convection. Convection means air getting into the motor and being pushed out of the motor by the fans. However, convection is more efficient when the, uh, the medium that's used to uh, produce that convection is thicker. It has a higher density because then you have more uh, amount of heat transferred uh, per unit of, uh, of time. What happens at higher altitudes is that the air is thinner, which means that the uh, amount of heat transferred out of the motor because of that process is going to be uh, lower. And then you can you have to uh, derate your uh, your motor 
because it's going to be able to dissipate heat less efficiently because of the fact that it's using uh, the uh, the convection mean, which is the air, is going to be less efficient at that higher uh, higher altitude. That is the reason why you use uh, altitude, as they you say this motor is rated up to this much uh, this much altitude. For higher altitudes, you need to either increase the number of fins that you have in the fan, increase the size of the of the of the motor, uh, work it on a, at lower temperatures. You you have to do other other things to to work motors at at the higher altitudes. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Uh, next is over to David. With reference to slide thirty, is it recommended practice to ground the CT outputs at both ends of the motor differential scheme? Is it not the practice to ground only at the relay in the substation, especially when the power cable is long, say one hundred meters? So uh, right now the slide you're showing is what you should be able to see my differential slides. Yeah, correct? We're, yeah, we're, yeah, we are on the differential slide. Awesome. So this is the slide that was referenced uh, in this question is number thirty. Um, so what we're showing here is we're just kind of showing in this diagram. It's just showing the YYCTs, right? And they're going to be connected in YY with one side going to ground here, right? So the question is is was a practice in doing uh, the ground, the CT outputs on both ends, uh, is practice not to ground only in the relay substation. So this actually can be grounded at, um, there's gonna be a terminal block or some type of marshalling cabinet that's gonna be where these dotted lines are uh, in this diagram that connect to the relay. So this is gonna pass through some sort of a terminal block and then probably go into the house uh, into the substation. Now these grounds, uh, it is uh, good to have these grounds in at the relay where you have one grounding point uh, for your CT circuit inside the control house. But uh, what happens sometimes too is your you don't have access to a lot of these different grounding points. So sometimes you have to ground it outside in the marshaling cabinet, uh, which could be outside in the yard or uh, in a pass through or in a vault underground, however that happens. Um, so really it's as long as you don't have two grounds on the same current circuit, you're okay. Uh, but it, what would, would be a good idea is to make sure that you can have access to these, to visually looking at this ground, wherever that connection's made. Because if you're in a troubleshooting scenario, then it's nice to go see where these connections are actually made. And you want to be able to put your eyes on them so you can verify them. Uh, if these things are hidden somewhere, then it, it, you know, of course, it just makes makes life a little bit more difficult at that point. But yeah, you can. There's not really a set. Uh, do I need to ground at the yard? Do I need to ground it here? Um, what we want to do is just make sure that we have access, we can see it, and make it to where it's only grounded once uh, per CT circuit, and we don't have any uh, double grounds in here. So there we go. All right. Thanks, David. Yeah, you are. Uh, next to yeah, next to a bell, is there a requirement for the CTs to be calibrated annually? Well, um, the requirement that you have to follow depend on your local regulations. That uh, that said, it is a good idea to check your CTs regularly. Uh, what I mean by that is that you should have as part of your maintenance schedule you should have a uh, the, the checking of the CTs uh, as part of regularly, I mean, with either one year, two years, or whatever your uh, local regulations say, uh, you should be able to, to meet that uh, for various reasons, not just to be, to, to you know, uh, uh, fill a, a requirement, but because uh, CTs characteristics change, the, the burden connected to the CT changes as the, uh, installation ages, your connections uh, become uh, rusted, uh, they become loose, especially in a, uh, a motor uh, a scenario where uh, most of the time you are in a place where there is a, a lot of, um, let's say, uh, vibration, there is a lot of uh, contamination and, and things like that. And uh, so it, it is a good idea, even if e your uh, local regulations say that you should have, I don't know, this much time uh, for, for uh, CT checking, maybe it's a good idea to, because 
the RCTs are the eyes that you have into the uh, operation of the motor, both CTs and PTs in the cases where you're operating with uh, motors which uh, voltage level requires you to use uh, potential transformers as well. Uh, those are your eyes into the operation of the motors and your protections are only going to be as good as your primary transducers, which are the CTs and PTs. Okay. So um, I would be that, I'd say that that's the question. All right. Thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so Sugosha, uh, Sugosha, how can we test a thermal protection? Okay. So, um, you know, the way, like, like they would explain earlier, so all this thermal overload element in a relay, uh, they are built on the basis of some thermal overload curves, you know. They define how this element would behave whenever it, it thinks it sees a overload uh, overload condition on the motor. And and these are uh, dependent on the equation, you know, I squared T times R. So what it means is that you would be injecting currents to the, you know, the, the phase terminals on the relay. So depending on the magnitude of the current and also how long this current is being injected to the motor, the, the thermal element in the, in, the, in the relay, it's going to you know, uh, see that the current is increasing for this much amount of time. And it, it cross checks with that with the overload curve that is set in the relay. So, so that is how you would test a thermal protection element. And of course, you, know, you would have to be careful when you test different uh, types of uh, you know, motor protection relays, especially the thermal overload elements. Uh, if it's a microprocessor relay or if it's a, you know, electromechanical or it's like a bimetal overload relays. Uh, because if you are going to test multiple points, you have to make sure that uh, the relay is, uh, the, 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 the element is cooled down, especially if it's a, like a bimetallic uh, style of relay before you can try your second test. But, but yeah, this is a basic idea to perform this test is to, you know, inject the current. Uh, based on you know above the setting, and and for a particular amount of time when it meets uh, that point on the overload curve for the element to trip. All right, it looks like that's all the time we have for questions today. We apologize if we didn't get to yours uh, live, but we will be working to follow up with you offline. As a reminder, a copy of the presentation, certificate of attendance, and a link to the video recording of the webinar will be emailed to everyone in about two business days. I'd like to thank you all for attending. If you could, please remember to answer our survey. That survey will include a field for you to request a quote or a demo if you're interested. But once again, I'd like to thank you all for attending, and I hope you all have a great weekend.